Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm with the lovely Dr. Hampton from Chicago, my favorite city next to San Francisco, even though I'm from Chicago. Um, and we're going to go through, uh, we're going to go through my blood work because uh, there's some interesting results after me predominantly me eating meat and eggs for the last year and a half. Thank you so much for uh, joining me this morning. Well, thank you. Uh, and I thank your audience for caring so much about their health that they decided to join us. So oh, I yeah. think that every nugget will uh, enhance our life journey. And rather it's helping you or a family member or a friend, uh, hopefully some nuggets that we share today will be important because we all get blood work and we all need to have a way to interpret it. So let's let's have some fun today. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. So I think we should just jump right in because there's a lot of interesting numbers to go over. And so yes. the first one we're going to talk about is the hemoglobin. Yes. And um, first of all, thank you for teaching us Spanish today. I <laughs> <appreciate> <laughs> yeah, I'm, me like, too. I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on here? I looked at that and I thought I was, you know, still waking up. But uh, <laughs> but thank you so much. Shout out to my oldest son, Brandon, who has a Rhythmus Negros podcast and he does it in English and Spanish. So he would... <gasps> He would, yeah, he would, he would kill this. He would look at this and say, oh, this is a piece of cake. So, so, so far, uh, and I want to say this out loud, so many people in the low carb keto or kind of work community are going to hear concerns from their doctor about uh, what they should or shouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, you know, eating based on their, you know, their labs. And let me tell you, um, uh, this so far looks pretty good. And I'm not surprised that you're, hemoglobin. I'm going to do it in English if you don't mind. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's and right. um, can you explain a little bit what that is? That's just the red blood cell. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I'm okay. glad. Yeah. So the hemoglobin is the red blood cell. Uh, alias is 14. You can see the range to the right, 12.3 to 15.3. But, but, the, but the thing that I want to emphasize here is when you are eating an animal-based diet, you will have a better or an easier time getting your hemoglobin into the normal range. So if it's normal, uh, it'll stay normal. And if it's not normal, it should uh, creep up. So so yours is in a normal range, Alia. And, uh, but that's because the iron uh, mm -hmm. from animal products are more bioavailable. Uh, many of us have heard terms like heme iron, uh, non-heme iron, and you get heme iron primarily from uh, animal uh, food sources like meat, seafood, et cetera. And the key to that is that it's about anywhere from 15 to 35% more, you know, absorbable, right? Mm -hmm. Now, now let's compare that to Popeye the Sailor Man, who will say eat spinach, right? <laughs> Got some yes. big arms, you know, and, um, and the reality is that's a non-heme iron and that mm -hmm. type of iron is uh, from plants, but particularly spinach in this example, you only absorb 2% of the iron. Because, mm. you know, so plants are not the best source of iron. Another thing that you'll see on a CBC is rather it's uh, microcytic or macrocytic. And, and those terms mean rather or not, uh, you'll see things like MCV. Um, mm. And if that number's low, um, then that means it's a microcytic anemia. And that's things like iron deficiency, mm -hmm. uh, thalassemias, and chronic diseases. Then you have macrocytic anemias, and that would be things like uh, B12 or folate deficiencies, right? Now, that's important because going back to this animal-based diet, um, it's important that you know that the best sources for B12 and folate come from animal sources in terms of its bioavailability. So, so B12, for example... Uh, salmon, clams, yogurt, things like that, eggs, and of course, our favorite beef liver. <laughs> our great <laughs> source is a, it is, it's our favorite. Ali is our favorite. Yeah, it's don't, our don't, favorite. Don't, don't it's fight. our favorite. Don't fight it. Don't fight it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then uh, folic acid. Uh, we think about folic acid. I used to deliver a ton of babies uh, before my new life. My babies now are seniors primarily, but, um, but, but the, uh, folic acid is what we give moms to prevent mm -hmm. neurotube defects when they're pregnant for our babies. Uh, but, but you also get folic acid from beef liver again, uh, mm -hmm. things like, uh, you know, um, 
um, I think eggs as well. So, so you can actually get all of these vitamins from an animal-based diet, which means that you will greatly reduce your risk for being anemic if you're a carnivore on keto. Now, the last, the other thing I wanted to mention real quick is copper. So if I have somebody in front of me who's anemic mm -hmm. and they're struggling to, and we, we've done all the tests and we can't seem to figure out, we've done B12 tests, we've done folate tests, and we can't figure it out. Copper is one of those hidden things that can also cause you to be anemic. And, uh, oh, by the way, you get a lot of copper from beef liver as well, oysters and things like mm -hmm. that. Now you can get it from plant sources, beans and uh, things like that, seeds and nuts. But again, the bioavailability is not that great, but copper is involved in iron absorption, transport, and utilization in general. So I think that's another thing to keep in mind. And one more thing, I know we talked a little bit about coffee before we got started. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hate to bring that up, but and, and we all, who doesn't like coffee, right? So that's why the lines at um, Dunkin' will always be long. Mm -hmm. And even the expensive Starbucks, the lines will always be long. long. But the problem with um, coffee, in the, as an example, is that it has those anti-nutrients. And the reason why spinach is probably not doing a good job for iron is because they have anti-nutrients, lectins and tannins and oxalates. But the tannins are things that you find in coffee and, and, and it may be the highest in tea and in chocolate. And it does interfere oh, wow. with iron absorption. So, so I think at the end of the day, it's important that people understand that if you're on a keto or carnivore diet, you're probably are not going to be anemic, uh, not to mention the uh, protection for your gut so that when you're absorbing nutrients, it'll be much healthier uh, because a lot of the autoimmune conditions and stuff have a lot to do with your gut health. And people who are on a carnivore diet or a keto diet, they tend to have a healthier gut. So, so, so for so far, so good. Um, I, your hemoglobin <laughs> is good. So the doctor can calm down and, yeah. <laughs> and not worry about that. So let's see what else you got on your list of labs. Okay. Oh man. Okay. So this is, um, uh, blood sugar. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. I was like, yeah. what the hell is that? And, uh, <laughs> <It's> blood sugar. <laughs> that's cool. So I see the blood sugar and, um, obviously, so the bottom line is with blood sugar guys, um, is, you know, you can kind of see that range that's 70 to 99. That's basically, the range you want to be in uh, when you're fasting. Uh, you don't have to be in that range when you're not fasting, but uh, certainly when you're fasting, that's a good range. And and because your body has the ability through your liver to make glucose, which is our energy source in the form, that's our sugar, but we call it glucose, on demand via the liver gluconeogenesis. So so if you're sleeping at night, you're, you're going to take some stored glycogen that's stored in your muscle and your liver, and you're going to convert some of that into energy and then, but your liver can also kind of create it. And this is the irony, guys. You know, where does that glucose come from uh, for carnivores? Oh, they get it from uh, the protein yes. and the fat. They break it down via that process to uh, use it on demand. See, the cool thing about us not relying on exogenous or uh, sugar sources from our diet is that we do it on demand. So if I eat two, that sweet potato pie, uh, that's not on demand. That's just, and then my, it can overpower my system. Uh, your body's a lot smarter than that. And it'll, it'll simply take that uh, protein, amino acids, convert it to glucose for you. And you'll never really go overboard with glucose by that process. So carnivores get plenty of, uh, of their uh, glucose needs met by eating animal protein, just like the bear who only eats salmon, which is protein mm -hmm. and fat. Mm -hmm. They do not need to uh, do what Winnie the Pooh does. Uh, they do not <laughs> shout out to all the Winnie the Pooh fans. <laughs> uh, you don't have to have the honey. Now, if I'm a bear and I see honey, I'm going to eat some honey, right? Or yeah. some berries, but mm -hmm. I don't have to eat those things. And if you think about those polar bears in those cold environments, they're not going to find honey or uh, berries. They're going to have to, you know, eat other animals and they do just fine. So, so I think that's, so you're looking good with your glucose and right below Great. that is the scary thing. Oh my God. Yeah, it's, just the, it's all the, it's all. Yeah, exactly. Here we go. This is what everyone really wants to hear about. They don't want to hear about the red blood cell. They want to hear about the cholesterol. <laughs> right. And that's true. <laughs> and that's, and that's what we'll look at. And I'm really uh, happy that, um, 
um, that you have this information. So let's look at it. So the first thing that we notice is at the top is this uh, so-called, uh, we call it the HDL or good cholesterol. Yeah. And um, that cholesterol is important because it carries, uh, the way I always like to envision it with my patients is I, I tell them, you, you're trying to tuck point your house. Um, and I live in a brick house. I know it kind of looks like some brick behind me, <laughs> but I live in a brick house and um, I need the HDL to carry the extra mortar away from my home uh, whenever I'm tuck pointing my house. So that's what the HDL is kind of doing. It kind of carries the cholesterol away from your arteries. Let's consider our my brick home as your arteries uh, and, and, and when you want to take it away. Now, if I go down to the bottom there, it says LDL. The LDL is actually the part that's actually doing the tuck pointing. So I want, so this is a, a very okay. important message. Yeah. When, when you have a brick house or you have arteries, I need to repair it periodically, right? And the thing that causes the damage is mostly inflammation from sugar and starch, right? Mm -hmm. So the worst, the, the, the last thing you want to do is say there's this, you know, that LDL is a bad thing. Now we need the LDL to do the repair work to tuck point our, 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 our arteries. Uh, but then we don't want, if we have too much LDL, then we need something like the HDL to take it away, right? Okay. So okay. you have, so what you want to do is have a high HDL and a low LDL mm -hmm. ratio. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, your HDL um, is high, which is good. And and then your LDL, which is not too bad itself, they don't have the scale there. Oh, let's see, L maybe it's uh below down there a little bit low. Oh yeah, here it is. Yeah, it's okay, a... so yeah, I see it. So they're saying, I think they're saying less than. Let's that... see, the, the one forty six is what it says. Yeah, uh, it says it's in the high limits. Right. So okay, limits. fair. They okay. yeah, it depends on who you talk to, right? So let's go back up a little bit. Okay. And so at the end of the day. Um, your LDL is in, you know, upper limits of, con you know, where they want it to be. But but because you have so much of the good cholesterol, it kind of works itself out. Mm -hmm. What you don't want to do is blame the uh, LDL, which is going to your arteries to help do repair work, right? Okay. And and if you have a, a house where you're having a lot of parties, right, you may need more repair. Mm-hmm. That's a party where you got a lot of sugar and starch, right? Because you're not a carnivore. And in that setting, your LDL may be even higher because it's trying to fix things, right? Yeah. And so what you find is that many times those numbers get better. But the And although we haven't, I don't know that you've had the um, particle sizes, but for people who are concerned, you get the LDL particle sizes. And with the particle sizes, you can you can have large and small particles the large particles tend to bounce off your arteries and not get in the crevices of your brick home. And, you know, and the large particle, the small particles will get into the crevices. So if you have concerns about your LDL, which can go up a little bit on a lower carb diet, keto carnivore, most, for most people, it'll level off. But what will happen that's more important is not the quantity of the LDL, it's the quality. So the quality of the LDL particles on any low carb diet, keto kind of where as an example, your quality improves, meaning that the large particles may go up and the small particles go down. In other words, that's what you, and the opposite is true for a plant-based diet. Oh, wow. So, isn't, that, so they, isn't that weird? So they may have an improvement in their overall LDL cholesterol, but the quality is goes in the wrong direction. Interesting. So it's very interesting. <laughs> now let's go back to this lab and look at the triglycerides. Yeah. And that number was extremely low <laughs> at 58. So and that's bad. Also, triglycerides. Up that's fats. fats. That's fats. Okay. That's fats. So, and any logical person would say, okay, I'm not sure I want fats just floating around in my blood, right? Okay. But wouldn't that potentially cause inflammation? Wouldn't that potentially increase my risk for heart disease? And the answer is that's true. So, so, so you look at the H, you know, triglyceride to HDL ratio, and you want that number to be less than. Two. Another way of looking at it, if you take the HDL, which is 78 in your case, and you multiply it by two, you want the triglycerides to be less than that number. In your case, that's like a 156. <laughs> yeah. And it's like 58. Yeah. So it's like it's like literally like two to three times less than 
that number. Therefore, your ratio is very good. In fact, your ratio uh, is probably so less it's 78 than... Divi it's 58 divided by 78 is what Correct. I'm Correct, right. Okay, so and you're you... dividing the triglycerides with the HDL, and it's like 0.74. Exactly. So a okay. ratio of two is okay. A okay. ratio of one is really good. A ratio of less than one is ding, 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 you're a winner. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so for all the people who are carnivores who worry about their cholesterol, number one, your total cholesterol means nothing. Why would I say that? Even though your numbers, uh, you know, why why would that 241, which is high, right? Why why don't I care about that? Because it includes the... Um, your LD, It includes the other markers of your cholesterol. So it has the LDL... And the HDL is something called the VLDL. So mm -hmm. if it has the good cholesterol, which can, which in your case is high, then that's going to make your total cholesterol high. Does that make right. sense? So yeah. it doesn't mean anything. So I would, I would, so <laughs> it's the cholesterol and LDL it, are poor predictors of heart disease. Better predictors are your blood pressure. Your bl blood pressure is two times more predictive of heart disease than those numbers. Oh, wow. And your fasting insulin is. 6.7 times more predictive of a future. Oh, wow. Disease. So so you can oh, almost, wow. so when I talk to patients, I, I literally say, don't worry about the cholesterol. And if we're going to worry about the LDL, we better do LDL particles because otherwise it's, we don't know if you have good or bad. Therefore, so when I look at your overall profile for cholesterol, I say we need to celebrate. So when your husband and you hang out later today, go get a ribeye and say, yay, we're doing really good. <laughs> We're doing let's, good. Eat some, let's eat some meat with more cholesterol in it. So we can... <laughs> yeah. Funny thing is on this, on my thyroid panel, it put it in different places. So maybe we can go over this and then I'll roll down to the next. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that is weird that they didn't kind of lump them together. Yeah, they didn't lump them together. I need yeah, to that figure is out weird. what page the okay. T3 is okay. on. But um, yes. here is T4. And uh, the thyroid stimulating hormone. Yes. Thyroid so, stuff. Thyroid stuff. So I want to say, I remember this so clearly. My doctor in Chicago told me that my, when I, I don't know, maybe I didn't take my prescription or something. Like he saw that I didn't pick it up and he called me and said, I swear to God, he said my thyroid numbers were dangerously high. <laughs> it's oh, like really? stuck in my head forever. <laughs> Like forever, he maybe I don't know. Maybe he said a different word, but that's the concept that's forever implanted into my brain. <laughs> that is great. Well, that would scare anybody uh, yeah. if they said that, and that would make us nervous. So, yeah, I think most of us, when we uh, think about the thyroid uh, as a clinician, the standard of care is you just get a screening TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, and uh, that test then will prompt you to do other tests. And so um, in a, you, so you have the hypothalamus in your brain that goes to the pituitary and then your thyroid is kind of in your neck. So if I, if, if the pituitary, which is kind of right, you know, in fact, if we do surgery, we go through the nose to get to the pituitary. Okay. We, um, what happens is it's going to release, you know, uh, hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone to tell the thyroid to release thyroid. So if I am releasing TSH, which is being measured here uh, towards the bottom, and um, and there's the thyroid's not working, it's low, it's not really able to release it, mm -hmm. then the TSH number will be high because okay. it's going to keep trying to, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. people who have uh, low thyroid will find that their TSH is high and people okay. have an overactive thyroid. It is no need for the pituitary to tell the thyroid to release hormone. So the TSH may be super low because you're making that your thyroid is making it. Maybe you have a thyroid nodule or something or something okay. growing, making mm -hmm. thyroid. So in your case, your TSH, um, I think that's the horm hormona one. Yeah. Yeah. The bottom. Yeah, yeah. That one is is in the normal range, but it's high normal, right? Okay. okay. So you're kind of pushing that envelope. But technically, uh, most doctors would look at that and say, oh, you're good, right? Yeah. However, yeah. How, but but when I did my functional medicine training, I learned that um that you sometimes they tighten that range a little bit. So they would probably say that's a little too high normal. Mm -hmm. And that would prompt a functional medicine doctor 
to go ahead and order additional labs, which would then include the free T4. Okay, which uh, is which right is, above. Which is right <laughs> above. And, yeah. and, and, and that, so we have uh, T4, free T4, which is more of an inactive type of thyroid, okay. uh, has to be converted to free T3. Which uh, I how, have also. <laughs> yeah, that good. So, so yeah. that number right now, uh, for the free, so to, so so for a low thyroid scenario, which is what we're concerned about here, uh, we would uh, because of the TSH being borderline high, mm -hmm. um, that would say, well, let's see. So we would expect maybe the T four to T three would be on the lower side. Uh, so, but in your case, the the T four seems to be in the normal range. So I think we'll. But there's other labs that, so we'll sure. look at the free T3 and any other thyroid tests they've had. And then, okay. so if I see a patient like you that did not have anything, I would say, let's get a free T3, free T4, uh, maybe a reverse T3, uh, and the antibodies. You worry about uh, the antibodies. So mm -hmm. let's kind of see what else we got here. Okay. Oh, well, there's okay. it. I see it now. There it is. Good. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, free T3 is also looking like it may be in the normal range, I think. Uh, yeah, they're saying 2 to 4.4 for adults. So, so far, you have a borderline TSH, TSH test with normal T3s and T4s. And do you, did they do any antibodies test for you? Yes, one of them. Oh, okay, got you. Oh, okay. So, I don't know how to yeah. say this at all. It's anti yeah. antibodies, uh, anti tiro global. Okay, yeah, there we hello. go. Hello, <laughs> hello, yeah. Well, let me, in on an English level, it'd probably be the anti thyroglobulin antibody. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, about, that's right? what we would call. And that, that test measures uh, your level of antibodies in the blood that are, uh, you know, against thyroglobulin, but that's a protein found in thyroid cells. So okay. when you have antibodies to that, we start to worry about autoimmune diseases uh, that could be the cause. So it's very interesting that you may have a autoimmune condition. Now, this is one thing I want to say out loud for those who check us out today. Um, one of the reasons why people go into uh, keto or carnivore is to address autoimmune conditions um, because one of the biggest risk factors is having what we call a leaky gut. Uh, what we, you know, and and a lot of that gut repair work occurs when you eat keto or carnivore. It's like the perfect elimination diet. Um, and you think about, um, uh, you know, Dr. Kim Berry's uh, wife, uh, Nisha Berry. Mm -hmm. She has Hashimoto's, right? Mm -hmm. And Hashimoto's is an example of a condition that you'd be at higher risk having uh, the, the, not the proper human diet, but the wrong diet. And, right. and, and your gut may then, uh, you know, be weakened and those tight junctions in your gut may not be, you know, may allow you to absorb things that are larger than they should be like these proteins. Your body then sees those proteins, some of which may look like the thyroid, and then you create antibodies to them. So your diet is the most important thing, but Hashimoto's, is an autoimmune condition that you you may be at risk for based on this lab because it does show you have antibodies. So, sure. um, and we're going to say you're not diagnosing me on a on a YouTube video. That's you're right. We're definitely not doing that. <laughs> right. And and I think that's why I said may. <laughs> and and it's really important. So let me tell you what I would do for you because because yeah. one of the questions people are going to ask is okay. Well, if all my labs are normal except for this antibody, what do I do with that information? Well, the first right. thing you do, you always talk to a endocrinologist because uh, you want the gland doctors, which are the endocrinologists, to chime in and give feedback. But the first thing I would do as a family doctor, before I even got to that point, I would ask my patient, do they have symptoms of a low thyroid, right? Because mm -hmm. some of it is lab work. But we always are taught treat the patient, not the numbers, right? Great. And what are exam? So think of the thyroid as like a, a one of the. It's like the engine uh, that deals with your metabolism and things like that. So people who have low thyroid tend to be tired. Uh, mm -hmm. They tend to have problems with weight gain. Uh, they tend to have issues with uh, constipation. Mm -hmm. uh, their skin may be dry. They may even have a hoarse voice. Things like that. So. 
It's mm -hmm. uh, they may be just kind of sluggish. Think about a slow mm -hmm. thyroid as a sluggish mm -hmm. person that's just trying to get through the day, blah, blah, blah. And an overactive thyroid is the opposite. They actually instead of a low heart rate, they would have a high heart rate. They would have oily skin. They would have, you know, diarrhea uh, and things like mm -hmm. that. They palpitation. So, so I think it's the opposite. But, but the bottom line is I would ask the patient, are you symptomatic, right? And if they're not symptomatic, I would be less concerned. Uh, but, but I do think that it's important that you have a, a clinician of the endocrine spectrum to kind of be involved because okay. it's going to come down to, well, if my numbers are okay, should I ever be treated? Should I be on a, 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 a thyroid medicine like levothyroxine and things like mm -hmm. that? So I think that's going to be, that's, those are the conversations, Alia, that you're going to be having. Yeah. But, but right now, um, not that the clinicians are going to agree, but I think that the fact that you just happen to choose a uh, carnivore dietary pattern is perfectly suited for a person who has these thyroid issues because mm -hmm. you may be at a point where you may not need to uh, have treatment and your your diet may be helpful uh, to the extent that based on your numbers, you may do okay. Uh, yeah because you need, uh, and all the hormones, uh, a lot of the hormones we think about require fat and cholesterol in your diet, which is insane, but mm -hmm. that's just how it works. So, so I mm -hmm. think you're doing yourself, your thyroid a favor and yourself a favor. The other things I want you to be thinking about, and I know you're going to go beyond just talking to uh, just, you know, anybody, you're going to talk to people who are, uh, you know, in the field of holistic medicine, right? Yeah. I yeah. think it's really important that you don't just stick with conventional people. You want to you want to talk to people who uh, really understand uh, diet, understand yeah. how important it is to reduce stress, understand how important it is to uh, exercise and do things like that. I think that's going to be really important. When I talk to patients about their thyroid, however, I always tell them things like, well, your gut's important. So some people, uh, although I think carnivore is great for your gut, some people will take um, uh, probiotics because it also helps to heal your gut in many cases. Mm -hmm. uh, some people do supplements like selenium mm -hmm. and uh, vitamin D. So there may be some, some herbal things you can do to sure. help your gut as well. Uh, while you're kind of going through this process. So that's kind of how I would frame that. Great. Thank you. Um, should we look at, there's one more antibody one, if I find it fast here. Yeah, see where that's at. And if you have, uh, and I think that's a good point. Like if you have multiple uh, antibodies that are positive, it it, it kind of helps to uh, make the diagnosis more probable. Oh, so, okay. You know yeah. what I mean? So I yeah, think I, I think that's going to be really important. Um, and uh, yeah, I didn't really see Here the it other is. one. Is Here that it? Oh, okay. Yeah, gotcha. it says antiperoxida. Yeah. Peroxidasa, anticuerpos. <laughs> so that it's antiquerpos cool. that uh, are antibodies that have antiperoxide, too much peroxide. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, you're funny. Well, you know, that that's a logical conclusion, but yeah. at the end of the day, it's also <laughs> a type of, <laughs> not sure I would go that far, but it, it, but it's definitely one of the enzymes that deal with, uh, there's a thyroid called TPO. I know when okay. we do our lab, we'll just put TPO in there and mm -hmm. that's a, a thyroid peroxidase uh, it's, maybe enzyme. Maybe it's that one. Maybe it's that yeah. one. Okay. Yeah, so I think there's antibodies to that. And that's another indication that the thyroid tissue is being attacked. And okay. that's clearly associated with Hashimoto's disease. And okay. likely uh, the endocrinologist is going to kind of say, hey, this is kind of what we're working with. And so I right. think for you, it's going to come down to, you know, what do you do with that information? If right. you're doing really well, is there any harm in uh, not treating it? versus uh, treating it. Now, mm -hmm. you could going back to the TSH, I said you were high normal, right? Right. Based on a functional medicine model, they would probably say, yeah, it's probably close enough that it would make sense to treat it because mm -hmm. it's it, their range is tighter. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So it's, yeah. so it's clear. And then we go, so it'll be a combination of that information and you looking at the symptoms that you're having and the symptoms will then define how aggressive you should be with treating. But the good news is, 
I appreciate that your doctor even ordered those tests. Uh, most doctors do not order those more oh, specific. I got to stop you here. I ordered these. I just oh, went to the lab and I paid out of pocket. All well, of there you go. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Well, shout out to the doctors that do order these tests. And I'm glad you did it because I, I and this is what's important about this, uh, this conversation is yeah. if you're concerned, if your tests are borderline, you need to either get, the, you know, go to own your own labs, Dave Feldman or whoever, get your labs because your doctor may say you shouldn't be worried. Well, right. clearly, if Alia didn't do this on her own, she wouldn't even know this information. Right. And a shout out to Anthony, Dr. Anthony Chafee, because he's the one who said, oh, you need to check out the antibodies. And then yes, finally yes. got around to it. So yes. yeah, well, shout out to uh, Anthony. He's absolutely right. So we're yeah. we're right. We're, we're on the same page for sure. <laughs> yeah, and I exactly. think I saw I think I saw uh, some C peptides and some other labs. So oh, let's yeah. So let's, go, let's go through those. OK, so. The C-peptide uh, got me and my husband talk, having various conversations. So here's the C-peptide. I'm mm. going to say I think it's wrong because <laughs> the lab we ordered them at sent them to a different lab. And I'm mm -hmm. curious sure. if something sure. happened en route. But can we understand what the C-peptide is and yeah. it's, what these uh, numbers would mean if, if it was true? <laughs> right. And it, it may or may not be true. So, yeah. let's, so it would be scary because I think for those who uh, are not familiar with that term, uh, you know, when your pancreas, which is under your left rib, when your pancreas is making, uh, you know, uh, insulin, there's a byproduct of that process that occurs, which is a C peptide. So those things are kind of being done at the same time. And so if you, you it, it can give you a sense, they tend to rival each other. So if okay. you have a low C peptide, it means that you're not really making a lot of insulin, right? Now that right. can be a little scary because the first thing that comes to mind is, oh my God, that means that I have type one diabetes, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That, exactly. You're like, oh Lord, oh my God. What have I done to myself? Yeah, I what need what's happened? Again. <laughs> that damn carnivore diet. <laughs> but actually, it may that may not be true at all. So I think the most important thing is that when you have a, a animal based diet like we each have you're definitely going to have a very low sugar level as well. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you may have a low C-peptide level. So it does not mean necessarily that there's a problem. It right. just means that your pancreas is kind of on vacation and chilling. Your pancreas is not uh, having to produce a lot of insulin. Therefore, it will not need to make uh, C-peptide. Now, the, the, but, but any good doctor is not going to stop there. I never okay. assume anything. So okay. there are other things that can... Um, that you need to think about. Uh, one of those things is something called Addison's disease, uh, where your adrenals, uh, your adrenal glands are not making enough uh, the hormone cortisol and aldosterone. So one of the things that may be worth doing uh, is to check some uh, Addison's disease type labs, whether it's the cortisol, aldosterone, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I doubt that's gonna be an issue. Um, sure. You know, liver disease is important. So a lot of times when you get a complete metabolic profile, you want to make sure your liver tests are okay. And 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 a lot of people in the metabolic community that we live in will do a C peptide, uh, not really necessarily for uh to determine if somebody has type one diabetes, but we also do it to determine if they have something called uh if it's too if it's high. If it's too high, it's the opposite of mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Addison's disease. It could be uh, Cushing's disease, which which means that uh, you are uh, you know you know it's going to be a high number. You can have insulin resistance if it's high. We do it for that purpose. We do it for type two diabetes. Now, obviously, if your pancreas is making a lot of insulin, you can have a pancreatic tumor. At the end of the day, uh, in your particular case, with it being low, I would have my doctor. Uh, do a uh, islet cell antibody test. Um, and that would, to, you know, just going back, just like with the previous situation with Hashimoto's, uh, if you have antibodies uh, to islet cells, which make insulin, that could be an indication that there's an issue. Now, why do I think you don't have type 1 diabetes, even though this is more <laughs> academic for me at this point? Sure. Because you would have a high uh, blood sugar. You, your glucose uh, yeah. is okay. Uh, so I don't think that that's an issue, but, uh, I think that you just don't, your pancreas is on vacation. 
So it, that's or, why. Or I'm, it could be something happened in the blood in transit. I want to redo. It could be that too. You always redo stuff. Yeah, you always redo stuff when you are, uh, you know, looking at something that doesn't make sense. But it may make sense for you, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't worry too much about it. I would just go ahead and follow through, trust sure. but verify. That's okay. what I would do. Great. I, so um, I did have a question because my husband and I were looking at this. We're like, is it possible that I'm making it so that my pancreas is just not only on vacation, but becoming like a, useless? Does that make well, sense? Like, yeah, am I going to put it in a condition where no, it's going to be harmed? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, okay. <laughs> there's been a, I've heard Dr. Ben Bigman and others talk about this. Uh, so, you know, are you having some type of resistance problem? Uh, because it's sleeping and, and the reality yeah. is you're not, you're, you're, the reality is it doesn't take any time. It may take a while to reverse insulin resistance in a person who's sure. overweight, metabolically unhealthy. It takes like 24 hours to fix this. So if it's sleeping, oh. It's, oh, okay. it's a light, it's a light sleeper. Oh, It'll okay. wake up <laughs> your body. <laughs> so yeah, your, your body initially may be like, Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's yeah. sugar. I need to do something about sugar. I got to make yeah. insulin. But it'll okay. wake up fairly quickly. There's no evidence to suggest that that's going to be harmful okay. uh, at all. Some people will say, well, that's why you have to do carb loading, you know, mm -hmm. you know, cycling and things just to kind of keep it awake. We don't have enough evidence, I don't think, at this point to suggest any of that's necessary. Okay. Uh, and we've had people doing carnivore and things like this for years. I mean, Dr. Eric Westman has been doing research on this to, since 2002, 22 years. Nobody's having issues with uh, their pancreas not being able to create insulin when it's needed just because mm -hmm. it's been chilling. So okay. any concern <laughs> about that at this point yeah. is not necessary. So you're good. Sure. You're okay. Good. And I also want to make clear to anybody who's watching and is still skeptical that I literally have zero type one diabetes symptoms. <laughs> right, zero. Right, or, right, I, right, yeah. right. That's a good point. Yeah. So I think that's that I've a looked at, I've, I've Googled, I've asked AI, I've, I've looked at all the symptoms now and I'm like, okay. And we could look at this next, my A1C as yeah. another factor to take into that. Yeah. And that's, sugar. Well, that's, that's the confirmation that we're looking at going back to trust, but verify. So a person yeah. who is not making any uh, insulin, uh, because their C-peptide is so low, would certainly not have an A1C that low. And part of the reason why it's low is because what we talked about earlier, your body is converting glucose to fuel via gluconeogenesis in the liver on demand. Mm -hmm. So your demand is so low that there's no need to convert. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you don't over-convert. Mm -hmm. You only convert what you need. If you over-convert it, that A1C would, that those those uh, glucose molecules would attach to the hemoglobin. And the A1C, of course, measures the hemoglobin over the, you know, the, the glycation, the glucose sticking to hemoglobin over about 90 days or so. And that number would be way higher than mm -hmm. uh, where it's at. And so we want that number on this scale to be less than six. On the um, uh, American scale, it would probably be like 5.6 or less. Okay. And you're certainly doing fine. There are okay. circumstances when uh, carnivores, keto folk may have a slightly higher A1C because you uh, have a hemoglobin that may be more resilient. And instead of lasting for 90 days, it may last for like 130 days or so. Mm -hmm. In that setting, it may falsely elevate that hemoglobin number, making people get concerned. Maybe it's not a 5.2 like yours. Maybe it's a 5.8, 6.0. In mm -hmm. that case, you can do, uh, there's an albumin test that is a glycosylated albumin test that doesn't deal with hemoglobin that can be ordered, and that'll distinguish whether or not there's a sugar issue. In your case, there is no sugar issue. So I would This not, is um, great. Yeah, this you're getting great. good news today for the most yeah, part. Yeah, this is good it. news. Mostly good news. Okay, and uh, then there's one more, if I can find it. We yeah. did the glit. We did that. There's insulin hiding somewhere. It's in there insulin is hiding somewhere in here. And while you're looking for insulin, I yeah. want to say to those who are not familiar with this, your insulin level I mentioned earlier was uh, 6.7 times more pre predictive of a future heart attack. So everybody should get a fasting insulin level and you want your insulin level uh, to be as low as possible. Uh, the scale in my clinic would say between three and 28 we okay. don't really want it to be 28 or 
We want it to be less than 10. And having a low insulin level and having a normal glucose level are some of the most predictive things of longevity. Oh, that wow. You can measure. So if you have a very low insulin level, which you do, 5.16, your glucose level was like in a good range, mm -hmm. then that means that your chances of uh, being here for a while for your kids and your husband yeah. and, your, and your future grandkids and your future great grandkids are much higher yeah. Uh, because you're not burdened, your, bo your body's not being burdened by excessive insulin. Insulin is the fat storage hormone. It's the one of the most inflammatory hormones in excess. Yeah. And arguably, uh, other than a, a heart scan, a coronary artery calcium score test, there's very few things you can do to assess your risk for future disease because mm -hmm. high insulin levels equal inflammation in your arteries equal mm. stiffness and constriction in your arteries and and you insulin levels being high make you hold on to salt but those arteries are not just going to increase your risk for heart disease they're going to increase your risk for um, a stroke because you have blood vessels in your brain dementia is called mm -hmm. type 3 diabetes mm -hmm. so it'll increase risk for dementia number one cause of kidney failure is a high sugar level and you have high insulin levels well another sugar insulin problem amputations right. i mean i can go down the <laughs> list but they're all blood vessels but oh yeah. by the way the, the glucose that raises the insulin level the glucose also sticks to the nerves oh wow now you got neuropathy mm -hmm. and you got and you got nerves and arteries all over your body so if we fix one thing if that's the one thing we walk away from having looked at your labs if we fix one thing we need to fix our insulin level. And if we fix that, yeah. now we have a path to not having the so-called chronic conditions that have plagued society. Mm -hmm. And you don't do it by taking uh, metformin, which will reduce insulin resistance. You do it by, uh, or Jardius, which makes you urinate out glucose. Mm. You avoid the poison. Mm -hmm. If you avoid the poison, you won't have to worry about metformin and Jardius and other medicines, which are... Um, I. Shout out to all the pharmaceutical people. We appreciate you. My wife is on insulin. She has type 1 diabetes. We want her to have her insulin. What we don't want is for people who don't have to be on medicines to be on medicine when okay. it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so I think that you being taking ownership of your labs and saying, I'm going to order my own labs and I'm going to order stuff that my doctor may refuse to do. Doctors literally will refuse to do an insulin level because they say you don't need it. And mm -hmm. I think what they're saying is that I don't understand it. I right. don't know how to you know, talk to you about it, so you don't need it. But if mm -hmm. I'm a customer, a paying customer, I should have a collaborative partner who's willing to do some things that maybe right. I think are important. And then, we, and then I want them to use their expertise. Maybe they have to do a little research to then walk with me so I can you know, evaluate rather than not those numbers are meaningful. But right now... I think you're doing great. And even if you are, you know, you put that, they put that Hashimoto's label on you. Yeah. It doesn't matter because it ain't going to have no effect on you. Yeah. It, true. You know what I mean? It'll just yeah, be, exactly. it'll be like, okay, I got that, but I, you know, I got this. It's okay. And yeah. that's why your lifestyle journey is the best way to deal with all of those things. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Cause it reconfirms that I'm doing the, the right thing. Cause I, like I said, I feel better than I did when I started, when I started, That's I was right. not doing good mentally and physically. And it was magic within days. I keep, I keep yeah. saying days because I have a video on day three when I started my YouTube channel and I'm like, wow, it's 5 a.m. And I'm walking around. This is this is crazy. <laughs> like right. I used to wake up or That's I right. feel nauseated or headache. And now I'm like, wow, I'm up at like early, ready to go. That's right. And so yeah. Okay. So to, yeah, I did say I, before, I don't know if I mentioned here, I quit coffee to maybe, maybe that'll yeah. help because it I should. drink too much coffee. Well, it'll, it'll, um, coffee is irritating to your gut. Mm. Let me say this out loud. If I could tolerate coffee, mm -hmm. I probably would drink coffee. <laughs> I'm just being, I mean, coffee, I make love to coffee when I drink it. <laughs> so I love coffee. Hilarious. So, for those of you who, that's why, this is why we don't want to be so extreme mm -hmm. that we tell people yeah, that they have to become like, you know, like a lion diet right. person. Everybody right. doesn't have to do that. 
And if I choose to have moments of indulgence, I should be allowed to. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I don't drink coffee much because it irritates my stomach. And I'm Mm -hmm. in this space because of an irritable stomach issue, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I know if I drink coffee, I'm going to feel great. I'm going to love it. But I may struggle later in the day. So I don't do it for that reason. Now, having said that, um, if a person tolerates coffee, Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that they're concerned about. And they're not worried about the tannins and the anti-nutrients. And they don't have a, you know, a big concern about their gut health because they they just have a a gut of steel that I don't have. (laughs) Then I think people should be allowed to. Uh, Sure. You don't have to be a pure carnivore to be healthy. You just have to understand these are the potential things that can harm me. Coffee does have anti-nutrients in it. Do, am I, do, is it worth it to then consume that? Do I get, is the return on investment greater? And for some people, the answer is yes. For others, the answer is no. I'm in a camp of avoid coffee, only have it when I really need it. And, uh, and that's why I am not drinking it much. So, but I think you you can, if you're a coffee drinker, just start weaning down a little bit and then listen to your body. Yeah. Oh, and and your body will answer. Yeah, exactly. Your body will answer. So, um, I went cold turkey and I was, I did a video about it and I'm basically okay. <laughs> I had very little right. straw symptoms. I was okay. And that was my biggest concern. And That's I just want to say before we go on with the tests, um, when I quit drinking coffee within 24 hours, I just felt a calm that I didn't recognize. <laughs> yeah. Well, you <laughs> won't, you won't, caffeine. <laughs> You won't because you, right. So, so, and that's a, a very important message. Um, yeah. I, um, people come to me and they say they're tired mm-hmm. and then you're like, well, tell me about your work. Tell me about your sleep. And they'll say, well, I work night shift and that's already a problem. Right. Number two, I, I average about five hours of sleep. Terrible. So, so, so if you average five hours of sleep, there, there may be some people on the planet that do okay with that, mm-hmm. but most people on the planet need more sleep. So the question, so, so, so you weren't born with a coffee deficiency, but if you don't get enough sleep, mm-hmm. you're going to struggle. So I think that, right. so, so that's what I learned. Like if I get an, if I'm on a schedule, I even wrote an article, people can search uh diet doctor, Dr. Tony Hampton sleep mm-hmm. for the article about sleep and it has tips, right? If we get enough sleep, we probably won't necessarily need coffee, but there's other mm-hmm. things you can be doing. Okay. Obviously the fuel you put in your body, Mm-hmm. which is what we're all about. If you eat the the uh, the essential amino acids and fatty acids, which is what we do with carnivore or keto, uh, you'll do fine. Uh, I have a trainer that I, I, I thought I was going to be working with, out with this morning, but it'll be the next day after this recording. <laughs> yeah. And because I exercise, I literally went on a light jog yesterday uh, and I did some Dr. Ben Bokikio exercises with the bands, right? Mm-hmm. That's what I did yesterday. And because of that, the way I feel this morning is a lot different than I would have felt if I hadn't have done that. Okay. Right? Yeah. So you just feel better. So mm-hmm. so there's so there's a there's a soup of things that we need to do to be healthy and have energy. I, I have people in my practice who are distressed. Mm-hmm. And because they're under stress, they feel tired. Right. You know what I mean? So yeah. so I just think you have to, that's why I have a nest, nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep, mm-hmm. how you think, recovering from trauma. Those types of things will give you some things to think about and say, okay, I got this diet down. What about movement? And yeah. if you can't move, you do what I did. You get a trainer who will make you move. You'll literally, uh, I go to her uh, sessions and I'm like afraid of her. She's shorter than me. <laughs> She's not as big as me, but I'm afraid of her because I know it's going to be a, a, a hour of uh, focused uh, exercise. But yeah, but man, I, but but without her, there are days when I wouldn't do it. And and right. honestly, Alia, I actually got a text from her, I think the day before saying, I need you to do this. Oh, wow. While I'm at it. So she texts me, we need coaching and support because yes. we're made of flesh and blood. We're human mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we're not perfect and we're going to struggle. So I'm really- right. So for those who can afford a trainer, get one. Uh, for those who just need a, a friend who can be an accountability partner, get one. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're, you know, Dr. Ben Bokikio's exercises, he's a guy in the low-carb community. It's only 15 minutes twice a week, so you can start there. 
So we can maybe even have a link to that in the notes. Sure, I'll do that. But yeah, we'll make sure because people need to start, start, you know, the most important thing you do is change your diet. Because yep. if you change your diet, you'll feel better and you'll want to do more. And then you think about your sleep, your stress, and the next exercise is not the first thing, but you got to do all of those things right? so that you can then walk away uh, being the best version of yourself. And that's, that's what I really want people to be able to do. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. Um, I just want to look at one or two more tests yes. and then, then we're, we're basically done. So I want to talk about my, my vitamin D. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> because, um, I don't first, I don't take any thyroid medicine. I don't take any insulin and I don't take, I have at some points taken vitamin D, but I haven't taken any recently. So okay. I'm not supplementing with vitamin D or anything else. So I just want to look at this. What do you think about this crazy vitamin D? <laughs> yes. Well, um, uh... <laughs> to be honest with you. So the scales that we use yeah. would say somewhere between 30 and a hundred. Oh, okay. Where you want to be. So, okay. so when we look at your, so if that scale is similar, it says 30 to 40. It says yeah. 30 to 40. And that's okay. an interesting, I've never seen it with that tight of a range. Yeah. Now, having said that, um, uh, higher tends to be better. Okay. And most people, are not getting enough vitamin D. Okay. Um, uh, people with darker skin may struggle more. Mm, people okay. who live in the Midwest, like in Chicago, mm -hmm. may struggle more. Sure. Uh, but even people in Florida can have a low vitamin D. Mm. So I generally will ask people in my practice, I think of the, like, I don't take a ton of supplements. I may do electrolytes, mm -hmm. uh, uh, vitamin D3, K2. Mm -hmm. And okay. we, do the, we do the K2 because the uh, vitamin D's job is to help you uh, hold on to calcium. and But too much calcium in your joints can cause arthritis. Too much calcium in your arteries can cause uh, heart disease. Mm. So we need an usher. Uh, we need somebody to usher that calcium from those two places into mm -hmm. our bone. And okay. that's, what K, that's what K2 does. So nowadays mm. you'll see 3D K2. Sometimes your doctor will prescribe 50,000 once a week, but mm -hmm. I would also still advise people to take K2. Okay. Uh, when you're deficient in vitamin D, you know, that's really, uh, during COVID time, a lot mm -hmm. of people, the people who were vitamin D deficient tend to be the, some of the people who were passing away. Mm -hmm. uh, but vitamin D being low also correlates with insulin resistance. Uh, it oh, correlates with diabetes and just metabolic disease in general. People who are, obese tend to be at risk. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it tend to be deficient in vitamin D and people who have heart disease uh, tend to be uh, deficient in vitamin D. So vitamin D is one of those things that's very hard to get enough from your diet. So that's the one, right. one of those things that I would advise everybody to consider supplementing uh, as they're trying to achieve their uh, metabolic health. Great. I, I want to say I live up in the mountains and I like to walk around uh, in my sports bra outside. We have to live on a private cool. property. So cool. I think that helps living at the equator, yeah. living up in the mountains. So I have an unfair disadvantage, unfair advantage, maybe that my my family in the north doesn't have. That's right. A huge advantage. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I would absolutely uh, take advantage of that. I, yeah. I, I, don't, I think I'll retire in a warmer place and probably be getting more sun in the yeah. When I'm able to sit outside, like on a day like today in Chicago, when it's probably yeah. going to be nice, I always sit on my deck, even if it's super hot, just for a moment, just to get some of that sun. Absolutely. Yeah, it's good. 15 yeah. minutes a day at our moment. minutes a day. That's right. That's right. No <laughs> doubt about it. Okay. I think the last one on the APO B is not really, is that an important test or did I waste my money on this one? <laughs> no, you're, you're so funny. No, you didn't waste your money because... Um, um, all tests have values. Okay. Even if you, even if you say to me, uh, I value some tests more than others, I think yeah. that, and I would, I would value that test more than I value the cholesterol and the LDL. Oh, oh okay. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. That's why so, it's also good to get other people's viewpoints. <laughs> so yeah, you're going to get, that's the, and this, this is the thing you'll hear so-called experts talk yeah. about different topics. Yeah. You still got to put it together for you because right. most of nutrition science, a lot of this stuff is still evolving. So okay. nobody's really an authority on anything. Mm. We're, we're, we're just, we're just trying to, so you're, you're doing a collection of data. 
And yeah. you're saying, uh, the, the, what does the, just like in court, what's the preponderance of evidence suggesting? <laughs> okay. It's suggesting that Ali is a pretty healthy person. That's what oh, it's suggesting. I love that. I, yeah. And what does this show? Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, absolutely. What does APOB show? They're, they're basically, um, in fact, uh, in the future, you may want to get an APOB and an APOA, but oh, they're, okay. both, they're both involved in uh, what we call lipid transport. In other words, oh, they're like okay. transporters of fat. Okay. In your body. And, but they have different roles. So the B, when you think about APOE B, you want to think about uh, something that is, um, is part of that LDL is very, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it has a structural component like the LDL. And it, and again, it helps to carry fat and cholesterol mm -hmm. throughout your body. Okay. Um, where, the so LDL I think about apoB B, and for the uh, apo lipoprotein A I think about HDL, which is the so-called okay. good cholesterol. So-called, so, yeah. <laughs> so the LDL is kind of going to the going back to our brick wall, right? Yeah. Kind of they're kind of hanging out, going to the brick wall to do some repair and things like that. Where the uh, apo A is kind of like the HDL. So just logically, yeah. If you think of it that way, to keep it simple you probably don't want to have too much of the B. Right? Okay. Yeah. So that's like LDL. And that okay. and then the, the mm -hmm. APO A is more like the HDL. So 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 when you do the ratio, mm -hmm. that's a better because you need both. You need uh you need the guys doing a tuck point in the house. You do need the LDL or and yeah. the APO B, but you also need the HDL and the okay. APO A. So you want to have a ratio that's where we're kind of tuck point in the house and we don't turn a brick house into a stucco house. Okay. So you yeah. A, so so you don't so you don't so yours is decent in that that number is not too high. Okay. Okay. Great. So in the future you'll get an APO lipoprotein B to A ratio and that'll okay. be a better overall test. But I think you're doing fine with what you've done. Okay. And then you also did this uh, test called the homocysteine. Again, yes. these are for those who are checking us out. These are what we call metabolic measures because we know meta. I call myself the metabolic health doc because when you measure these things it'll give you a sense of, am I metabolically healthy? Mm -hmm. So the homocysteine is another test that is that correlates with your risk for uh, heart disease. It mm -hmm. correlates when it's high. Uh, you, you may have more inflammation because that type of high test suggests that there's potentially some damage mm -hmm. in your arterial walls, yeah, uh, your risk for clotting and heart attacks and stroke and all of those types of things are going to be much higher. So I think is one of the many inflammatory markers that you can get. There's uric acid test, there's GGD, GGT test, and other tests that are inflammatory. You don't have to get all of them, but you just want to have a, you don't want to <laughs> sure. go crazy, right? Yeah. But you want to have a sense, am I inflamed or not? And right. if I'm not inflamed, maybe it's my diet. Maybe mm -hmm. it's my stress. Maybe it's my lack of sleep. Maybe it's my spouse. Shout out to all the spouses who stressing <laughs> us out. <laughs> Hopefully it's not my spouse, right? I yeah. love my wife and she's been good for me, but there are some spouses and we need to talk to the therapist because <laughs> I, I feel less stress at work than I do at home. There's a problem. So we yeah. need to fix that or we need to do a Beyonce <laughs> and just say to the left because you have to think about everything. Right, you have really to, important. yeah. It's really that's, important. That's why we want to think about everything. It's not just fix the diet. You fix the diet and you have dysfunctional relationships in your life, you're still going to be sick. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I think all Absolutely. of that matters. Yeah. All so. of it matters. All right. Well, I like uh, what I see, Ali. I like what oh, I see. Oh, I love that. I love yeah. that. And then I ask myself, why doesn't my butt shrink? <laughs> oh, Lord. Hello. Well, in my neighborhood, they want the butts to not shrink. <laughs> so... So that's another podcast for another day. <laughs> what? People, are, people are paying money, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I know. Okay. Okay. We're going to end in a second here, but I do have to say like these girls in Colombia have very nice butts and, but I think some of them get implants and I'm like, why are you doing yes. that? Why are yeah, you doing that? Yeah. It's because <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know when the uh, surgical thing became at more popular and I'm yeah. totally, I'm okay with people deciding to invest in themselves let me just say sure. that first okay because i have plenty of patients that do okay uh, however uh what's normal and what's not normal the i think for some people um it's a fast pass to get there a little faster 
Uh, yeah. But what I see in my clinical experience is that if you do that, you do well, you don't have complications and things go well, what happens is you still got to exercise. Like, because if you sure. just do that and you don't like maintain it. Right. Uh, so I think the key is if you do it, uh, then you need to make sure you're moving your body uh, yeah. to support that. And yeah, it's uh, there are some beautiful women in Brazil and and every, <laughs> and I think it's such a, beautiful uh country in terms of the ladies that the standards are they, they just keep raising the standard it and is, everybody's trying to be perfect and there is no such thing as perfect so nope. but i just think people you do what's best for you yeah and if you do it do your research make sure you're safe i mean there are some uh i remember kanye's mom she didn't do that but i think she had a a, a lift uh or a tummy tuck or something mm -hmm. like that yeah but she was probably not in a position to do that because her doctor the initial the first doctor said no and the second mm -hmm. doctor said yes so we want to oh. be safe out there guys sure. uh being here a long time with our families is more important right uh, but if you go to the gym and you work on that body you will based on what god how god made you you're going to shape mm -hmm. yourself into exactly what you were meant to be mm. and you don't have to necessarily do that but for those who do we got your back we just want to make sure we do it safely Sure. Okay. Thank you. And um, now that we're at the end here, do you have any last words you'd like to say? Well, I know that, um, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. I appreciate the work you're doing with Healing Humanity and Carrie and Adam. I think that work is huge. I am inspired by that. Uh, I, I want to say to my audience, thank you for just checking out Ali, a supporter. Like, subscribe, share, because uh, we need more people who are sharing their journey to convince other people to do the same. Uh, we are going to have a metabolic revolution uh, um, rally in Washington. In fact, I'm going to be doing, I'm not sure when the video is like, coming out. Like Washington, like, D.C. or Washington, D.C. Okay, good. October okay. 13th. And I wow. will, and if you guys rather, depending on the timing of when you release this, but I will hook up with Carrie of Homestead Howe to do a uh, fundraiser on his channel. Oh, wow. I want to be on that. I want to yes, be part of that. You can be part of that. That's, that's coming up. So I think that'll be, it'll actually be a week after our recording. Okay. So it'll be the following uh, week. So if you uh, definitely reach out to Carrie and I would love to have you there. And you're pretty good with fundraising too. I so, <laughs> yeah. So we want to uh, get some folks to understand what we're trying to do. And the fundraising, um, and I'll have more details during the live, but uh, we're really trying to fundraise a little money to get some folk who normally wouldn't be able to go to something like that mm -hmm. uh, to to raise some scholarship money as well. That's going to be part of it. So that, oh, that's okay. something. But we'll, Great. what I'll do, what we can also do is maybe have a link to that uh, where people sure. can support it. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing I want to put out there. I'm looking forward to Nina Teichel will be there. Oh, wow. Uh, Robert Lustig will be there. Dr. Eric Westman will be there. Uh, Vinny Tortorich uh, and um, Mark Cucazello, who's a phenomenal uh, family doctor who does his work. Dr. Uh, 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 endocrinologist, Dr. Lant, I think is how I pronounce her last name. But bottom line is that it'll be, a, be several of us who will be doing a rally, maybe five minutes each, where we kind of get there and yell and scream at the audience mm -hmm. that metabolic health is the key. And low carb keto and carnivore are some of the best tools to help you get there. So let's awesome. make sure we share that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Dr. Hampton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope Absolutely. we can do something again. I'm sure we will. We will. <laughs> I like you. So we're going to have to keep hanging out. <laughs> we are. <laughs> <laughs> and when I visit Chicago, I will, I'm going to start saving up for a $70 steak for you and That's your wife. <laughs> You're funny, but we'll, we'll work it out. We'll, Lord if we got, we'll go to Longhorn or something. We'll find. Yeah, okay. There you go. <laughs> we don't have to break the bank. I like their steaks too. So we're good. I appreciate okay, good. you. We'll do that. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Enjoy the rest of the day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.